Breaking news. WYFF News 4. The trial of Donald J. Trump. Here is Lester Holt. Good afternoon. We are coming on the air to bring you NBC News live coverage of the Senate impeachment trial of President Trump less than 24 hours after his State of the Union speech to a bitterly divided Congress. Today, the final act, the vote on whether to convict and remove the president on the two counts of impeachment voted by the House exactly seven weeks ago. Now it's the Senate's turn, an all but certain vote for acquittal. Joining our coverage today, moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, and senior Washington correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, and with me here, NBC News legal analyst and former U.S. attorney, Carol Lamb. But we want to start with Casey Hunt at the Capitol right now with some dramatic news regarding one Republican senator who did some soul-searching, literally, and is going to vote, vote to convict. Casey. Lester, dramatic is the right word for what has unfolded here on Capitol Hill today. Senator Mitt Romney, once the Republican nominee for president, announcing that he is going to vote to convict President Trump on that first article, abuse of power. He, he's doing it, he says, because of his own faith and his conscience. Let's listen to a little bit of what Romney said this morning. Were I to ignore the evidence that has been presented and disregard what I believe my oath and the Constitution demands of me for the sake of a partisan end, it would, I fear, expose my character to history's rebuke and the censure of my own conscience. Romney was visibly emotional on the Senate floor throughout his speech. He talked about sending a signal to his children and their children that he did his duty. This is a remarkable break for Romney uh, with his own party. And we've learned just in the last few minutes, Lester, that he's going to be the only person here that we expect to make a dramatic break with their own party. We were watching three Democratic senators, Doug Jones, Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema, all up for re-election in swing states coming up. Uh, Joe Manchin, of course, a, a Democrat from West Virginia, recently re-elected, but still in a tough position. Uh, they all are saying they now will vote to convict the president on both of these articles of impeachment. So the Democratic Party will stay together. The vast majority of Republicans we know are going to vote uh, against convicting the president on abuse of power. So Mitt Romney, uh, once again, a man alone uh, here at the Capitol and in his Republican Party, Lester. All right, Casey, thanks very much. Much. We've been hearing from the senators making their remarks in this in the Senate itself. They just went on recess. When they resume, it will be gaveled in as part of the trial itself, uh, leading to the reading of the two articles of uh, uh, of impeachment, followed by the votes. Let's go to Hallie Jackson right now, who is also on Capitol Hill. Hallie, what do you have? So, Lester, White House officials uh, and sources close to the president describe this Romney vote that Casey's talking about as essentially disappointing but not altogether surprising. Although, frankly, Lester, there's not a lot of happiness about it, right? Because what you have now, when you look at the votes between Senator Romney as well as those Democrats who are in states that Donald Trump won, Senator Jones, Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema. This is just about the worst case scenario for the White House, other than if it were to, of course, be an actual conviction in this vote here, which is not the expectation from anybody on either side of the aisle. What this does is it robs the White House of the ability to call this a bipartisan acquittal, and it essentially doesn't let them argue that this is a bipartisan conviction for President Trump. I would watch for something we've started to see already from aides and advisors to the president, which is to say an acquittal is an acquittal. They will seize on the, on the idea if this vote goes the direction as everybody expects it to go, that the president is going to be acquitted. He will still be impeached, Lester. He will stay in office. The third ever impeachment of a president, of course, in U.S. history, and now the third ever acquittal of an impeached president in U.S. history. The difference here, of course, is that unlike former President Bill Clinton back in 1999, President Trump is running for re-election, and that is something that will be on display. It was here last night, Lester, at that State of the Union, and it will be over the next 10 months that President Trump's in office. All right, we're told they are coming back into session. Now let's take a quick peek, if we can, on the Senate floor. Um... Hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silence on pain of imprisonment while the Senate of the United States is sitting for the trial of the articles of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. As a reminder to everyone in the chamber, as well as those in the galleries, 
Demonstrations of approval or disapproval are prohibited. Mr. The Majority Leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, the Senate is now ready to vote on the articles of impeachment, and after that is done, we will adjourn the court of impeachment. The clerk will now read the first article of impeachment. Article 1, Abuse of Power. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives, quote, shall have the pow sole power of impeachment, unquote, and that the President, quote, shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, close quote. In his conduct of the office of President of the United States, and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of President of the United States, and to the best of his ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, Donald J. Trump has abused the powers of the presidency in that, using the powers of his office, President Trump solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, in the 2020 United States presidential election. He did so through a scheme or course of conduct that included soliciting the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations that would benefit his reelection, harm the election prospects of a political opponent, and influence the 2020 United States presidential election to his advantage. President Trump also sought to pressure the government of Ukraine to take these steps by conditioning official United States government acts of significant value to Ukraine on its public announcement of the investigations. President Trump engaged in this scheme or course of conduct for corrupt purposes in pursuit of personal political benefit. In doing so, President Trump used the powers of the presidency in a manner that compromised the national security of the United States and undermined the integrity of the United States democratic process. He thus ignored and injured the interests of the nation. President Trump engaged in this scheme or course of conduct through the following means. One, President Trump acting both directly and through his agents within and outside the United States government corruptly solicited the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations into A, a political opponent, former Vice President Joseph R. Biden Jr., and B, a discredited theory promoted by Russia alleging that Ukraine, rather than Russia, interfered in the 2016 United States presidential election. Two, with the same corrupt motives, President Trump, acting both directly and through his agents within the outside of the United States government, conditioned two official acts on the public announcements that he had requested. A, the release of $391 million of United States taxpayer funds that Congress had appropriated on a bipartisan basis for the purpose of providing vital military and security assistance to Ukraine to oppose Russian aggression and which President Trump had ordered suspended, and B, a head of state meeting at the White House, which the President of Ukraine sought to demonstrate continued United States support for the government of Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. Three, faced with the public revelation of his actions, President Trump ultimately released the military and security assistance to the government of Ukraine and has persisted in openly and corruptly urging and soliciting Ukraine to undertake investigations for his personal political benefit. These actions were consistent with President Trump's previous invitations of foreign interference in United States elections. In all of this, President Trump abused the powers of the presidency by ignoring and injuring national security and other vital national interests to obtain an improper personal political benefit. He has also betrayed the nation by abusing his high office to enlist a foreign power in corrupting democratic elections. Wherefore, President Trump, by such conduct, has demonstrated that he will remain a threat to national security and the Constitution if allowed to remain in office, and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance and the rule of law. President Trump thus warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Each senator, when his or her name is called, will stand in his or her place and vote guilty or not guilty as required by Rule 23 of the Senate Rules on Impeachment. Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6 of the Constitution regarding the vote required for conviction on impeachment provides that no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. 
The question is on the first article of impeachment. Senators, how say you? Is the respondent, Donald John Trump, guilty or not guilty? A roll call vote is required. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Not guilty. Mr. Alexander, not guilty. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, guilty. Mr. Barrasso. Not guilty. Mr. Barrasso, not guilty. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett, guilty. Mrs. Blackburn. Not guilty. Mrs. Blackburn, not guilty. Mr. Blumenthal. Guilty. Mr. Blumenthal, guilty. Mr. Blunt. Not guilty. Mr. Blunt. Not guilty. Mr. Booker. Guilty. Mr. Booker. Guilty. Mr. Bozeman. Not guilty. Mr. Bozeman. Not guilty. Mr. Braun. Not guilty. Mr. Braun. Not guilty. Mr. Brown. Guilty. Mr. Brown. Guilty. Mr. Burr. Not guilty. Mr. Burr. Not guilty. Ms. Cantwell. Ms. Cantwell, guilty. Mrs. Capito. Mrs. Capito, not guilty. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, guilty. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, guilty. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, guilty. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy, not guilty. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, not guilty. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons, guilty. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn, not guilty. Ms. Cortez Masto. Ms. Cortez Masto, guilty. Mr. Cotton. Not guilty. Mr. Cotton, not guilty. Mr. Kramer. Not guilty. Mr. Kramer, not guilty. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo, not guilty. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Cruz, not guilty. Mr. Daines. Mr. Daines, not guilty. Ms. Duckworth. Ms. Duckworth, guilty. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, guilty. Mr. Enzi. Mr. Enzi, not guilty. Ernst. Ms. Ernst, not guilty. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Feinstein, guilty. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Fisher, not guilty. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner, not guilty. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mrs. Gillibrand, guilty. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, not guilty. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Grassley, not guilty. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris, guilty. Ms. Hassan. Ms. Hassan, guilty. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Hawley, not guilty. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Heinrich, guilty. Ms. Hirono. Ms. Hirono, guilty. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven, not guilty. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Not guilty. Mrs. Hyde Smith, not guilty. Mr. Inhoff. Not guilty. Mr. Inhoff, not guilty. Mr. Johnson. Not guilty. Mr. Johnson, not guilty. Mr. Jones. Guilty. Mr. Jones, guilty. Mr. Kane. Guilty. Mr. Kane, guilty. Mr. Kennedy. Not guilty. Mr. Kennedy, not guilty. Mr. King. Guilty. Mr. King, guilty. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar, guilty. Mr. Langford. Mr. Langford, not guilty. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy. Guilty. Mr. Lee. Not guilty. Mr. Lee, not guilty. Mrs. Leffler. Mrs. Leffler, not guilty. Mr. Manchin. Guilty. Mr. Manchin, 
guilty. Mr. Markey. Guilty. Mr. Markey, guilty. Mr. McConnell. Not guilty. Mr. McConnell, not guilty. Ms. McSally. Ms. McSally, not guilty. Mr. Menendez. Guilty. Mr. Menendez, guilty. Mr. Markley. Mr. Merkley, guilty. Mr. Moran. Not guilty. Mr. Moran, not guilty. Ms. Murkowski. Ms. Murkowski, not guilty. Mr. Murphy. Guilty. Mr. Murphy, guilty. Mrs. Murray. Guilty. Mrs. Murray, guilty. Mr. Paul. Not guilty. Mr. Paul, not guilty. Mr. Perdue. Not guilty. Mr. Perdue. Not guilty. Mr. Peters. Guilty. Mr. Peters. Guilty. Mr. Portman. Not guilty. Mr. Portman. Not guilty. Mr. Reed. Guilty. Mr. Reed. Guilty. Mr. Rish. Not Mr. Rish. Not guilty. Mr. Roberts. Not guilty. Mr. Roberts. Not guilty. Mr. Romney. Guilty. Mr. Romney. Guilty. Ms. Rosen. Ms. Rosen, guilty. Mr. Rounds. Not guilty. Mr. Rounds, not guilty. Mr. Rubio. Not guilty. Mr. Rubio, not guilty. Mr. Sanders. Guilty. Mr. Sanders, guilty. Mr. Sass. Not guilty. Mr. Sass, not guilty. Mr. Schatz. Guilty. Mr. Schatz, guilty. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer, guilty. Mr. Scott of Florida. Not guilty. Mr. Scott of Florida, not guilty. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Not guilty. Mr. Scott of South Carolina, not guilty. Mrs. Shaheen. Guilty. Mrs. Shaheen, guilty. Mr. Shelby. Not guilty. Mr. Shelby, not guilty. Ms. Cinema. Guilty. Ms. Cinema, guilty. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith, guilty. Ms. Stabenow. Guilty. Ms. Stabenow, guilty. Mr. Sullivan. Not guilty. Mr. Sullivan, not guilty. Mr. Tester. Guilty. Mr. Tester, guilty. Mr. Thune. Not Mr. Thune, not guilty. Mr. Tillis. Not guilty. Mr. Tillis, not guilty. Mr. Toomey. Not guilty. Mr. Toomey. Not guilty. Mr. Udall. Mr. Udall, guilty. Mr. Van Hollen. Guilty. Mr. Van Hollen, guilty. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner, guilty. Ms. Warren. Guilty. Ms. Warren, guilty. Mr. Whitehouse. Guilty. Mr. Whitehouse, guilty. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wicker, not guilty. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden, guilty. Mr. Young. Not guilty. Mr. Young, not guilty. In this article of impeachment, 48 senators have pronounced Donald John Trump, President of the United States, guilty as charged. 52 senators have pronounced him not guilty as charged. Two-thirds of the senators present not having pronounced him guilty, 
the Senate adjudges that the respondent, Donald John Trump, President of the United States, is not guilty as charged in the first article of impeachment. The clerk will read the second article of impeachment. Article 2, obstruction of Congress. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment and that the President shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. In his conduct of the office of the President of the United States and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of President of the United States and to the best of his ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, Donald J. Trump has directed the unprecedented, categorical, and indiscriminate defiance of subpoenas issued by the House of Representatives pursuant to its sole power of impeachment. President Trump has abused the powers of the presidency in a manner offensive to and subversive of the Constitution in that the House of Representatives has engaged in an impeachment inquiry focused on President Trump's corrupt solicitation of the government of Ukraine to interfere in the 2020 United States presidential election. As part of this impeachment inquiry, the committee's undertaking the investigation serves subpoenas seeking documents and testimony deemed vital to the inquiry from various executive branch agencies and offices and current and former officials. In response, without lawful cause or excuse, President Trump directed executive branch agencies, offices and officials not to comply with those subpoenas. President Trump thus interposed the powers of the presidency against the lawful subpoenas of the House of Representatives and assume to himself functions and judgments necessary to the exercise of the sole power of impeachment vested by the Constitution in the House of Representatives. President Trump abused the powers of his high office through the following means. One, directing the White House to defy a lawful subpoena by withholding the production of documents sought therein by the committees. Two, directing other executive branch agencies and offices to defy lawful subpoenas and withhold the production of documents and records from the committees, in response to which the Department of State, Office of Management and Budget, Department of Energy, and Department of Defense refused to produce a single document or record. Three, directing current and former executive branch officials not to cooperate with the committees, in response to which nine administration officials defied subpoenas for testimony, namely John Michael Mick Mulvaney, Robert B. Blair, John A. Eisenberg, Michael Ellis, Kristen Wells Griffith, Russell T. Vaught, Michael Duffy, Brian McCormick, and T. Ulrich Breckbull. These actions were consistent with President Trump's previous efforts to undermine United States government investigations into foreign interference in United States elections. Through these actions, President Trump sought to arrogate to himself the right to determine the propriety, scope, and nature of an impeachment inquiry into his own conduct, as well as the unilateral prerogative to deny any and all information to the House of Representatives in the exercise of its sole power of impeachment. Impeachment. In the history of the Republic, no president has ever ordered the complete defiance of an impeachment inquiry or sought to obstruct and impede so comprehensively the ability of the House of Representatives to investigate high crimes and misdemeanors. This abuse of office served to cover up the president's own repeated misconduct and to seize and control the power of impeachment and thus to nullify a vital constitutional safeguard vested solely in the House of Representatives. In all of this, President Trump has acted in a manner contrary to his trust as president and subversive of the constitutional government to the great prejudice of the cause of law and justice and to the manifest injury of the people of the United States. Wherefore, President Trump, by such conduct, has demonstrated that he will remain a threat to the Constitution if allowed to remain in office and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance and the rule of law. President Trump thus warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy 
any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. The question is on the second article of impeachment. Senators, how say you? Is the respondent, Donald John Trump, guilty or not guilty? The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Not guilty. Not guilty. Ms. Baldwin. Guilty. guilty. Mr. Barrasso. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Bennett. Guilty. guilty. Mrs. Blackburn. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Blumenthal. Guilty. Mr. Blunt. Not guilty. Mr. Booker. Guilty. Mr. Bozeman. Not guilty. Mr. Braun. Not guilty. Mr. Brown. Guilty. Mr. Burr. Not guilty. Ms. Cantwell. Guilty. Mrs. Capito. Not guilty. Mr. Cardin. Guilty. Mr. Carper. Guilty. Mr. Casey. Guilty. Mr. Cassidy. Not guilty. Ms. Collins. Not guilty. Mr. Coons. Guilty. Mr. Cornyn. Not guilty. Ms. Cortez Masto. Guilty. Mr. Cotton. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Kramer. Not guilty. Mr. Crapo. Not guilty. Mr. Cruz. Not guilty. Mr. Danes. Not guilty. Ms. Duckworth. Guilty. Mr. Durbin. Guilty. Mr. Inzi. Not guilty. Ms. Ernst. Not guilty. Mrs. Feinstein. Guilty. Mrs. Fisher. Not guilty. Mr. Gardner. Not guilty. Mrs. Gillibrand. Guilty. Mr. Graham. Not guilty. Mr. Grassley. Not guilty. Ms. Harris. Guilty. Ms. Hassan. Guilty. Mr. Hawley. Not guilty. Mr. Heinrich. Guilty. Ms. Hirono. Guilty. Mr. Hoven. Not guilty. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Inhofe. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Johnson. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Jones. Guilty. Guilty. Mr. Kane. Guilty. Mr. Kennedy. Not guilty. Mr. King. Guilty. Ms. Klobuchar. Guilty. Mr. Lankford. Not guilty. Mr. Leahy. Guilty. Mr. Lee. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mrs. Leffler. Not guilty. Mr. Manchin. Guilty. Mr. Markey. Guilty. Mr. McConnell. Not guilty. Ms. McSally. Not guilty. Mr. Menendez. Guilty. Mr. Merkley. Guilty. Mr. Moran. Not guilty. Ms. Murkowski. Not guilty. Mr. Murphy. Guilty. Mrs. Murray. Guilty. Mr. Paul. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Perdue. Not guilty. Mr. Peters. 
Guilty. Mr. Portman. Not guilty. Mr. Reed. Guilty. Mr. Risch. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Roberts. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Romney. Not guilty. Not guilty. Ms. Rosen. Guilty. Mr. Rounds. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Rubio. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Sanders. Guilty. guilty. Mr. Sass. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Schatz. Guilty. guilty. Mr. Schumer. Guilty. guilty. Mr. Scott of Florida. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Not guilty. Mrs. Shaheen. Guilty. Mr. Shelby. Not guilty. Ms. Cinema. Guilty. Ms. Smith. Guilty. Ms. Stabenow. Guilty. Mr. Sullivan. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mr. Tester. Guilty. Mr. Thune. Not guilty. Mr. Tellis. Not guilty. Mr. Toomey. Not guilty. Mr. Udall. Guilty. Mr. Van Hollen. Guilty. Mr. Warner. Guilty. Ms. Warren. Guilty. Mr. Whitehouse. Guilty. Mr. Wicker. Not guilty, Mr. Wyden. Guilty. guilty, Mr. Young. Not guilty. Not guilty. On this article of impeachment, 47 senators have pronounced Donald John Trump, President of the United States, guilty as charged. 53 senators have pronounced him not guilty as charged. Two-thirds of the senators present not having pronounced him guilty. The Senate adjudges that respondent Donald John Trump, President of the United States, is not guilty as charged in the second article of impeachment. <clears throat> The presiding officer directs judgment to be entered in accordance with the judgment of the Senate as follows. The Senate, having tried Donald John Trump, President of the United States, upon two articles of impeachment exhibited against him by the House of Representatives, and two-thirds of the senators present not having found him guilty of the charges contained therein, it is therefore ordered and adjudged that the said Donald John Trump be, and he is hereby, acquitted of the charges in said articles. Mr. Chief Justice. The majority leader is recognized. I send an order to the desk. The clerk will report. Ordered that the secretary be directed to communicate to the secretary of state as provided by rule 23 of the rules of procedure and practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials and also to the House of Representatives the judgment of the Senate in the case of Donald John Trump and transmit a certified copy of the judgment to each. Without objection, the order will be entered. Mr. Chief Justice. The majority leader is recognized. Before this uh, process fully concludes, I want to very quickly acknowledge a few of the people who helped the Senate fulfill our duty these past weeks. First and foremost, I know my colleagues joined me in thanking Chief Justice Roberts for presiding over the Senate trial with a clear head, steady hand, and the forbearance that this rare occasion demands.
We know full well that his presence as our presiding officer came in addition to, not instead of, his day job across the street. So the Senate thanks the Chief Justice and his staff who helped him perform this unique role. Like his predecessor, Chief Justice Rehnquist, the Senate will be awarding Chief Justice Roberts the golden gavel to commemorate his time presiding over this body. We typically award this to new senators after about 100 hours in the chair, but I think we can agree the Chief Justice has put in his due and then some. Page is delivering the go. Thank you very much. Of course, there are countless Senate professionals whose efforts were essential. I'll have more thorough thanks to offer next week to all of those teams, from the Secretary of the Senate's office to the parliamentarians, to the Sergeant at Arms team, and beyond. But there are two more groups I'd like to single out now. First, the two different classes of Senate pages who participated in this trial, their footwork and cool under pressure literally kept the floor running. Our current class came on board right in the middle of the third presidential impeachment trial in American history and quickly found themselves hand delivering 180 question cards from Senator's desk to the dais. No pressure, right guys? So thank you all very much for your good work. And second, to find men and women of the Capitol Police, we know that the safety of our democracy literally rests in their hands every single day. But the heightened measures surrounding the trial meant even more hours and even more work and even more vigilance. Thank you all very much for your service to this body and to the country. The chair recognizes the Democratic leader. I join the Republican leader in thanking the personnel who aided the Senate over the past several weeks. Capitol Police do an outstanding job day in, day out to protect the members of this chamber, their staffs, the press, and everyone who works in and visits this Capitol. They were asked to work extra shifts and in greater numbers to provide additional security over the past three weeks. Thank you to every one of them. I too would like to thank those wonderful pages. I so much enjoyed you with your serious faces walking down right here and giving the Chief Justice our questions. As the leader noted, the new class of pages started midway in this impeachment trial. When you take a new job, you're usually given a few days to take stock of things, get up to speed. This class was given no such leeway, but they stepped right in, didn't miss a beat ferrying hundreds of questions from U.S. Senators to the Chief Justice on national television is not how most of us spend our first week at work, but they did it with aplomb. I'd also like to extend my personal thank you to David Houck, the Director of the Office of Accessibility Services, Tyler Pumphrey, the Supervisor, and Grace Ridgway, the wonderful Director of Capital Facilities. Everyone Grace's, everyone Grace's team on Grace's team worked so hard to make sure we were ready for impeachment. Gary Richardson, known affectionately to us as Tiny, the chief chamber attendant. Jim Hoover and the, cap and the cabinet shop who built new cabinets to deprive us of the use of our electronics and flip phones during the trial. Brenda Bird, one. Brenda Byrd and her team did a spectacular job of keeping the Capitol clean, and Leiden Webb and his team moved the furniture and then moved it again and again and again. Grace, we appreciate all your hard work. Please convey our sincerest thanks to your staff. Thank you all, the whole staff, for your diligent work through many long days and late nights during this very trying time in our nation's history. Mr. Chief Justice. I'm the chair also wishes to make a very brief statement. I would like to begin by thanking the majority leader and the Democratic leader for their support as I attempted to carry out ill-defined responsibilities in an unfamiliar setting. They ensured that I had the wise counsel of the Senate itself through its secretary and her legislative staff.
I am especially grateful to the parliamentarian and her deputy for their unfailing patience and keen insight. I am likewise grateful to the Sergeant at Arms and his staff for the assistance and many courtesies that they extended during my period of required residency. And thank you all for making my presence here as comfortable as possible. As I depart the chamber, I do so with an invitation to visit the court. By long tradition and in memory of the 135 years we sat in this building, we keep the front row of the gallery in our courtroom open for members of Congress who might want to drop by to see an argument or to escape one. <laughs> I also depart with sincere good wishes as we carry out our common commitment to the Constitution through the distinct roles assigned to us by that charter. You have been generous hosts, and I look forward to seeing you again under happier circumstances. The chair recognizes the majority leader. I move that the Senate, sitting as a court of impeachment on the articles against Donald John Trump, adjourn, sine die. Without objection, the motion is agreed to. The Senate, sitting as a court of impeachment, stands adjourned, sine die. The impeachment trial of President Trump is over. A president who has triumphed over so many ethically, morally, and perilous moments will not be removed from office. Uh, the vote uh, on the first article of impeachment, abuse of power, 52 to 48, one Republican voting guilt. The second article, obstruction of Congress, party line vote 53 to 47. Let's go to Chuck Todd right now for some first thoughts. Chuck? Well, look, it's funny you, the way you introduced that, Lester. It made me think this is the story of Donald Trump's life, okay, which is he, he pushes things up to the line, he crosses a line, he gets pushed back, and he somehow survives. Um, I guess the question on this, he has survived this, but the question is, does he survive November? Do, has this done more damage long term or has he united his party? I, I will say this. I think the Mitt Romney decision to vote to convict does deny the president sort of the ability to call it a bipartisan acquittal. That's, that's not an insignificant thing. But in many ways, the, the fact that the Republican nominee for president, the last one before Donald Trump became leader of the Republican officer. Party, decided to do this. I think it almost serves as just as much of a rebuke as a censure would do, and there's been some talk of that. In many ways, the fact that, that the first time we've really had a, an impeachment uh, in, in the modern era, that somebody from the same party voted to convict, I think it does serve as sort of an added exclamation point to the impeachment itself. And while his acquittal has been good for his base politics so far, I do think this, this impeachment vote will live for a long time with these senators. And the question will be, how long will it live with them and which one will haunt them more? Those that voted to acquit and those that, or those that voted um, to convict. I'll tell you this, I think of this like the Iraq war vote. You don't know today how this is gonna play tomorrow. Andrea Mitchell, uh, watching along with us in Washington, I got to step into your world yesterday, both of your worlds, uh, spending some time at the White House and the Capitol, and, and came away with the big question of whether this Congress, this government as we see it in this situation right now is going to get anything done here in the next year. I think last night's speech uh, answers that question. And except for emergency measures, it seems very unlikely because I have never seen the House chamber as divided, as partisan, as rancorous as it was last night. I spent years up there on the Hill, uh, covered the White House as well in foreign policy, and I've never seen this government so riven with anger uh, at the different functions, uh, the cabinet divided, as well as the central core of of this impeachment was over foreign policy, over Ukraine, over foreign uh, the accusation, of course, of abuse of power in inviting foreign interference into the into the American election. So there is almost no part of government that is together. There's a lot of criticism from the intelligence community of the CIA director Gina Haspel. We didn't quite see it clearly on camera, partly because of the way that one network pool was not showing opposition. But Gina Haspel becomes, to my recollection, and to career professionals and former. Republican CIA directors, the first CIA director to stand and applause and cheer with the 
especially uh, Republican House members on domestic issues, on political issues. And it seems as though even in that typically non-political, non-policy making part of government, that also was swept up. She was swept up, a career professional swept up in the politics of the moment. That's clearly a decision. You didn't see that with the military. The Joint Chiefs were grim and their hands folded, the Supreme Court as well. But there just is so much division. Obviously, Nancy Pelosi tearing the speech, the president not taking her hand, the president claiming incorrectly that he would sign a, a drug, a, dr a prescription drug lowering, uh, cost lowering bill the minute it hit his desk. There is such a bipartisan bill in the Senate. Mitch McConnell has not brought it up. There are bills, uh, you heard the cries of H.R. 3, that the, the claim that uh, the medical issues have already been approved and are sitting on the desk and the fact that the president claimed that he and republicans want to protect pre-existing conditions from being eliminated from health care right. which is exactly what the justice department is fighting all the way to the supreme court so i don't see anything getting done in election year all right andrea kristen welker is standing by uh, on capitol hill kristen uh, it's hard to imagine we won't, or at the White House, I'm sorry, it's hard to imagine we won't hear from the president soon. What do you, what do you, what's your read? Well, I anticipate we will hear from him, Lester, if not in a written statement on camera, if not today, certainly uh, in the coming days about this. But look, we know we're going to get some type of reaction from the president and from the White House today. And already we are seeing defiance from the president's inner circle. And frankly, they are bottom lining this. Yes, this was not the victory they were looking for. They wanted Republicans to vote in lockstep. That didn't happen with Mitt Romney breaking with his party. They didn't win over any Democrats, but let me read you just a sampling of what we are seeing from the president's inner circle. Kellyanne Conway tweeting, acquitted forever. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who is, of course, the president's former White House press secretary, tweeting, President Trump acquitted, vindicated, and more strongly positioned than ever to win re-election. And I think that is what you can anticipate seeing. The backdrop to all of this is, of course, the president who is going to be heading out onto the campaign trail fighting for re-election, and he is going to be bottom line this, focusing on the fact that he's been acquitted. We've already seen that from his campaign, which says that it has seen some of its highest days of fundraising in and around this entire impeachment process. At the same time, Lester, I think you're going to see him try to turn the page so that he can focus on what he believes he's accomplished. We saw that last night in his State of the Union address and what he plans to do over the next four years if he does, in fact, win re-election. All right, Lester. Kristen, thank you. Carol Lamb, our uh, NBC News legal analyst, is here. Uh, is impeachment now simply a relic in the Constitution or as, as, as a useful tool? It, does it exist anymore? You know, I, I think it does. And as I was watching the Senate vote here uh, to a conclusion that everybody expected, I was struck by how familiar a feeling it was to me in the sense that it was sort of... Uh, it was sort of a hung jury, if, if you will, and uh, sometimes even during a trial, you, you recognize that you don't have all the jurors with you and, uh, and it's not going, or maybe the case was just very difficult to begin with. But, um, you know, I do think that there are times when uh, one feels that, uh, you know, the, the body that, that is in charge of bringing, uh, bringing a case feels that they, they may not win. Uh, it's a tough case, but, the message has to be sent that uh, something will be done if if something is is wrong, and in this case, I think that's how Nancy Pelosi felt, and I think that the fact that several senators said that this conduct was inappropriate, um, wrong, and shameful uh, does have something of an effect on on people. Maybe not this president, but maybe the people around him. Let me go to uh, Michael Beschloss, uh, uh, his a presidential historian. Uh, Michael, we heard a lot going into this process about the Clinton model. Tell me about the Trump model. Will this be a reference point going forward if we ever walk this road again? Well, I think it might be, and I think I disagree a little bit with Carol Lamb, which is that I think impeachment has proven to be a more toothless device than maybe the founders intended, because they thought that we'd be in a situation where the Senate would act as a jury without regard to politics. They did not know that the Senate would be divided into two parties who were standing up to one another as fiercely as they are today. We've had three impeachments. Three times the impeachment has re resulted in acquittal. It's hard to imagine a situation in the future where a president is going to be easily removed 
with this kind of party situation and the fact that the jurors are, above all, people who are in political life. And that's one reason why Mitt Romney's not guilty vote today on the first article was such a historical standout. A president's party has a member who voted against his acquittal. Uh, Chuck Todd, you still with us? No, we don't have Chuck. Uh, let me go to Andrea on this question. Andrea, what's the message here? The president has shown no contrition. He continues to say, read the transcript, that nothing wrong here, even as members of his own party disagree with that. So in terms of the kind of president we'll see going forward, uh, what's the worry, especially among Democrats? Well, the worry does go back to Adam Schiff's closing argument that he will do it again. Look at what happened right after the Mueller testimony. The next day was that phone call on July 25th to President Zelensky in Ukraine. And that is, of course, the, what the prosecution said, what the House manager said. Uh, we don't know how this president will react except from the way he's reacted in the past. President Clinton went into the Rose Garden and apologized right after his acquittal. He expressed remorse, whether or not he was you know, truly remorseful, you can't read someone's heart, but he at least expressed it publicly. Uh, there were apologies from past presidents who have done things in the past. You think of Ronald Reagan avoiding this kind of, of prosecution by his very public apology over Iran-Contra in his second term, which could have gone a lot worse if he had not done that and had not had the wise counsel of his chief of staff at the time, Howard Baker. So this president does not seem to have anyone around him who would advise him to be remorseful, to change his behaviors, and whether or not he's learned a lesson from this about what is appropriate, what is not appropriate. But he's still saying that what he did was perfect, a perfect call, and it's hard to imagine him changing. Casey Hunt, uh, you're watching the mood there as the senators leave the chambers. Uh, um, among the Republicans, as we noted, some of them had, had made statements suggesting they believe the president's actions were inappropriate. And, and that being the case, do we expect to see a spiking of the football, or will it be kind of a somber but please reaction. Well, Lester, I think that so far Republicans here uh, are trending toward that somber kind of reflective mood more than a football spike. I'm not sure that that's true of the president's people. A number of his uh, political supporters were in the chamber for this vote, including Corey Lewandowski, who ran uh, his campaign in 2016. But uh, the Senate here uh, does not necessarily feel like we're going to hear from Mitch McConnell in a second, so this could change. But I don't get the sense that people People are necessarily crowing about it. A lot of Republicans very surprised about Mitt Romney's decision, and that really, I think, uh, has cast something of a pall over uh, some of the Republicans who uh, ultimately voted uh, to acquit the president of this charge. They have not come out against him as forcefully here in the Senate, other Republicans have, as some of the president's supporters, uh, his son on Twitter, for example, there, there have been some calls to throw him out of the Republican Party. That would be an extraordinary measure here on Capitol Hill. And his fellow senators uh, so far are simply saying when asked that they disagree uh, with what Romney did, uh, but they're not necessarily commenting further or calling for any sort of punishment. And, you know, Lester, I've been, I've been reflecting today on this long relationship between Mitt Romney and Donald Trump. It, it goes back a decade to when Romney was running for president in 2012, and Donald Trump ultimately endorsed him at an event uh, at a hotel in Las Vegas, and, and, Tr and uh, Romney at the time said, you know, he couldn't believe that this was happening. They are two figures who are incredibly different. Donald Trump, the reality TV star, often indulges uh, in, in what uh, his critics would say are uh, humanity's worst instincts. Mitt Romney, uh, he talks about his Mormon faith today on the floor, somebody who uh, values uh, politeness uh, above uh, many things in a way that Donald Trump ne ne doesn't necessarily. They are opposite characters characters in so many ways. And Trump has mocked Romney as a loser. Romney denounced him in 2016. Ultimately, though, uh, sat down with him for dinner, thought about taking a job as Trump's Secretary of State when that was on the table briefly after President Trump won his election. This is really an exclamation point, a final turn for Romney away from what his party has become under President Trump. It's just a, a very remarkable moment uh, for two uh, men who have led really opposite corners of the Republican Party through the last 10 years. Last yeah, time. Casey, thank you. And so, uh, again, the president has been impeached, as Nancy Pelosi likes to point out, and will remain impeached and, and, and throughout, throughout history.
however, he has escaped removal from office by these votes today on the two articles of impeachment. Uh, Pete Williams is, uh, is along with us today. Pete, uh, I'm sure the Chief Justice will be happy to get back to his regular job. <laughs> Nonetheless, did he perform in the role in the manner that was largely expected? Yes, I think so. Pretty much following the role that was set out by William, William Rehnquist and notably said, I think, corrected the record or made it clear for all times that the chief justice as presiding officer is not going to break any tie votes during the procedural uh, uh, terms of, he obviously can't, there's no suggestion of a tie during the, the final vote on whether to acquit or convict, but all those votes re leading up to it, there was some question about whether he would break a 50-50 tie and he made it very clear at the end of last week that as the unelected member of another branch, it wouldn't be appropriate for him to do so. You know, it was true before this process that no president had ever been removed from office by impeachment. It's still true, but you know, you asked a question about whether it's losing its vitality. Just look at this. The number of days the Senate was in session in impeachment trials, 34 days for Andrew Johnson, 23 days for Bill Clinton. This one, just 13 days. It still, of course, is a powerful tool. Remember, the only people that ever removed from office by impeachment are judges. But for presidents, I think you raise a good point. The trend seems to be that these things are shorter and shorter. All right, Pete, thank you. Uh, Kristen uh, Welker, I asked you a little bit ago if the president had, uh, had communicated, said anything, and apparently he's tweeting. He's tweeting, Lester, a little bit cryptically, essentially an image, a video of a Time magazine cover that shows Trump campaign signs lasting essentially into eternity. You see it there, 2036, 2040, 2044, and on and on, essentially making the case that he cannot be defeated, he will not be defeated by his uh, political rivals. So it is a statement of defiance. Now. He does not have any public events on his schedule right now, Lester. Will he add something? That remains to be seen. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw, at the very least, more tweets from this president today and likely something from Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham. They've obviously been watching this very closely here at the White House. And I can tell you, when Romney came out and made that announcement, all of the TVs were trained to that. White House officials watching the proceedings in real time. And so that undoubtedly happening now as they try to determine exactly how they're going to respond today further. Lester. Right, and of course he didn't mention uh, the impeachment at all in yesterday's uh, State of the Union speech, and some wondered if that was setting the tone for kind of breaking with the past and moving forward. I think that's right. I think his goal now is going to be to turn the page. He didn't mention the word impeachment. You're absolutely right, but it certainly did loom over everything, and it really fueled so many of those tensions that we saw last night, particularly between him and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi when she ripped up his speech at the end of the State of the Union address. The president tweeted about that today, Lester, and so I do think when we hear from President Trump, he will proclaim victory, undoubtedly. He will focus on that word acquitted, and then he will very quickly look to 2020 and the campaign trail and his reelection. And, and Carol, let me ask you about the, the legal hook that a lot of the Republicans hung, hung their hook on or hung their hats on, which was this idea that it was not impeachable, that it did not list out a specific crime. Do you think it, in the aftermath, Democrats will go back and look at how they drafted these articles and think again of maybe there was another way? Well, I think what... Uh, what any party bringing, um, bringing an impeachment charge will do in the future is really look at a lot of the defenses that were raised by the White House team in this case and make sure that they do things in a way that those, uh, those defenses aren't going to carry much water. You know, I, I, uh, I, I just think that um, people have learned a lot from this impeachment because they've never had a White House team that really did a defense like a, like a criminal case defense where any technicality they, they were willing to assert. So uh, I do think the sides have moved farther apart in terms of how these process will, processes will take place, but I don't think that impeachment is dead. I think it's, it's uh, still out there as a deterrent. Well, certainly a difficult, uh, a difficult chapter for yeah. the uh, American people as we uh, Come to this point now, the trial over. The president has been acquitted on each of two counts by a deeply divided Senate, ending a process that began just five months ago, a little over five months ago, with an anonymous whistleblower's complaint. The acrimony and political fallout, it's safe to say, are far from over in this election year.
I'll see you shortly with a complete wrap-up on Nightly News. But for now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News in New York. Good day, everyone. Now on WIFF News 4 at 5.